can live without food, you can live without a bath, you can live without a house, but you can't live without dignity, you can't live without sharing, you can't live without love, you know. And I think those are the things that need to be, are lost in, in, in a lot of uh, countries, in a lot of uh, systems. Um, and, and these are the things that are very, very important at the core of what the Kurdish revolution, what the Rojava revolution, uh, the revolution of the people of the Middle East means. Um, democratic confederalism is a system uh, developed by uh, the Kurdish leader, uh, the PKK leader, Abdullah Öcalan. Um, it's a system that rejects uh, nation-statism and is an alternative to nation-statism in the Middle East. Um, it's a system without borders. Um, it's predicated on the organization of uh, communities uh, from the uh, bottom up um, in the form of uh, democratic assemblies, uh, in the form of neighborhood assemblies, um, women's organizations, youth organizations, economic cooperatives, um, uh, which build up to make um, democratic autonomy, which then uh, lots of democratic autonomous regions make up the democratic confederalism. Uh, let's say you have a problem uh, with uh, your water supply. Um, the people will try to resolve it at the local level. Um, so people will have a direct um, impact. The people living on, on a certain street or a road will have a direct impact on their own uh, street uh, and resolve their own problem themselves. Because there's uh, assemblies at every level as well, people are always in the decision-making process. So you cannot say you do not have enough qualified uh, politicians because everybody is a politician. And they're looking at all these alternatives. For example, Linux uh, is the only uh, system which uh, has Kurdish on it. So a lot of Kurds prefer using Linux, for example, uh, which automatically then democratizes uh, the, the, the Kurdish people as well through using the Linux because it's an open source. Um, I mean other things like Bitcoin are being discussed, I've heard. Um, these are all things that I've heard, I haven't specifically seen it. But again with the principles and the philosophy of this, of this, of this movement, uh, of, of this revolution, these are all things that will be um, preferred over other closed uh, hierarchical or capitalistic uh, products or, or sources. But one line that you get all the time is people saying, oh, they're really still an authoritarian Marxist Leninist group, they're just pretending to all this book tonight stuff to get like foreign support. It's like, right, you know, here you are, you're on the terrorist list, you're going to try to get off it by claiming you're anarchists. <laughs> you know, I mean, come on, if you're looking for foreign support, you'd pretend to either be an Islamist or a liberal, you know, that way you'll get support. Yeah, they said there's three levels of the economy. There's the war economy, there's what they call the open economy, which is a traditional market bazaar economy, which has existed for thousands of years, and there's the cooperative sector, which is what they're trying to develop. They have academies where they offer sort of six-week courses on how to do democratic self-management in the economic sector. Unfortunately, so many resources are, well, they have one, in, let's put it this way, they have one major advantage and one major disadvantage. The one major advantage is they didn't have to collectivize a lot of stuff because a lot of it either was already collectivized or had been privatized into the hands of cronies of the regime who then fled. So about 50% of the land, for example, is collectively owned now. Um, they didn't have to expropriate anything. Um, however, so that's their advantage. The disadvantage is so many resources have to be put into the war effort. So we were at a cooperative, you know, sewing um, uh, workshop, and everybody was making military uniforms, um, you know, and um, and they were doing it in a you know, cooperative fashion, but still. Um, everything's focused on the war effort while it's lasting, which so they can talk about their kind of long-term vision um, of, of 
gradually building up the cooperative sector and the idea of ecological industrialism to it gradually replaces everything else. Um, you can't get rid of capitalism unless you get rid of the state, and you can't get rid of the state unless you get rid of patriarchy. But instead of saying, therefore, you know, let us get rid of um, you know, capitalism and then eventually the state will wither away and gradually, of course, patriarchy will, will fall out of its own accord. Um, they realize that's, that's not how it works. That's not going to happen. So we're going to do it the other way around. You know, we're going to start with the family, with basic interpersonal relationships. But of course, I have to say, Ojalan's role here has been important because as a uh, leader of a movement and organization, <clears throat> he has actually stood by the women and opened space for them to grow in politics, grow in ideological terms, grow in, grow in terms of self-defense, in, in social uh, aspects and all that, you know. So I think he has a, a very great role there. But even then, if the woman didn't actually demand things and, you know, didn't show that courage to demand things, then obviously um, Öcalan too perhaps would not have seen a need to open up these, these spaces but the opposite is also true. You know, we don't see many leaders who are actually opening up ideological, you know, self-defense, uh, social, economical, or whatever areas uh, for women's organizations. So there is this strong, that's why there's such a strong bondage between Öcalan and the Kurdish women um, as well. So in, in that sense, of course, this struggle meant many things like, the very people who resisted actually the tortures in the infamous Diyarbakir prison was the woman. Firstly, it was the woman who was killed, for example, in Paris, Sakina Janssens. Her, she's almost become a mythological figure because she was the very first woman who was to uh, not break down. She was the not very first woman, the very first person who was who did not break down in the face of all types of tortures that you can imagine, you know. And then it grew from there, you know. A lot of people, a lot of women actually rushed to the organization because they saw freedom there. Freedom from feudal structures, not only freedom from Turkish state, but freedom from feudal structures of the society as well. You know, and so they gained a lot of respect uh, because to live under those conditions, you know, like they, the women would not be able to even go on the street, maybe, especially due to the colonial powers suppression. And then this woman was on top of the mountains and fighting the the second biggest army of the NATO. I remember PKK was demanding the whole Kurdistan to be united, all four parts of the Kurdistan to be united. They were uh, really believing in involving the Turkish people or other ethnic minority in Turkey, but uh, luckily after a long period, Ojalan has reached that idea. That's not the way. Actually, if you wanted to, um, if if you wanted to make the, the revolution or to change the society completely from bottom the, to the top, 
So I think it was in 2004, he introduced himself to Mary Bookchin's uh, uh, books through the, the, um, the prison. And, and, and obviously before that, he had some hesitation about the Marxist idea and the current socialist idea, which is they, they, wanted, they wanted authority, they wanted the state. And he realized that's not the way, basically, even if people has a state, that does not mean it liberated. We got a state in, we got a government in Iraqi Kurdistan, but in fact, we don't have a freedom. We have a lot of corruption. We have a, you know, there is a, a big gap between the rich and the poor people. Think about the PKK historically. In the present, I think the kinds of things that Ojalan is saying are crucially they're very they're very important things that need to be heard if peace in the region is going to be is going to be achieved. Uh, another question is whether or not the major powers really want peace in the region. The Turkish state's uh, way of approaching things is to say that this is, you know, this is a, a terrorist group. This is the PKK. It's a terrorist group, and they're taking advantage of the situation. We, and in fact, when uh, the Obama administration gave gave the green light to attack ISIS forces, well, the Turkish state went went uh, went ahead and attacked uh, a few months back. Attacked uh, attacked the PKK PKK in the Kandil Mountain. So KPD forces, the Barzani's forces, are the ones who control the border at the uh, uh, with. With uh, with Syria, so it's part of the the, the Kurdish region in Iraq is is de facto uh, uh, very close to an independent state. It's got very close relations to the United States and uh, and lots of tension with their ethnic kin in Rojava doing this revolutionary project. And there, in fact, lots of pressuring from Turkey uh, to uh, to push their embargo. And so there been the the border had been closed for a while. And that was the thing that the people who organized our delegation were most ner were most nervous about our ability to actually get in, uh, get into to Rojava. Any future development of the wider Kurdistan region is going to be of great interest, economic interest, uh, to Western countries as well. I think it's fair to point out that there is a genuine sympathy, increasingly, amongst Western governments and particularly European public about the um, Kurds' right to self-determination. Uh, the British in particular, but to an extent the French as well, were largely responsible for denying Kurds the right to have their own state in the 1920s and of course the infamous Sykes-Picot agreement during the First World War carved up the Middle East in the interests of London and Paris, not in the interests of the people there. So there is a certain guilty conscience maybe uh, and people beginning to realise in Britain and maybe in France that uh, it's time that the Kurds were given uh, a greater say in their own future and possibly to have an independent state at some stage. Uh, goodness knows what the boundaries that would be. Confederation of Kurds, Arabs, Syriacs, Aramans, Turkmens, Armenians and Chechens freely and solemnly declare and establish this charter. Uh, so you can hear how it's the people, we, the people, constituting all these uh, ethnic groups are the ones establishing this charter, not a ruling authority body. The 
there are many ways in which you can reach charts. Um, and starting off from uh, where you are, the countries you're in, the, all over Europe uh, there is a population of Kurdish people and community representations of Kurdish people who you can find uh, and work with them. Another thing that is important for people to see is to visit Rojava if they can, to the other cantons, um, where they can see how the direct democracy model has been implemented and uh, also they can visit the refugee camps. It, it is a very uh, important experience for people who, who care about uh, democracy, socialism and equality uh, all around the world to do, to go and see how this direct democracy model has been implemented and how uh, the, the needs of the people that need aid.